Today, we are going to make fun of more Western mainstream media articles and how they are covering the Ukraine war. This article was published on The Hill, and it is titled, Ukrainian Invasion Takes a Bad Turn for Russia. It was written on the 26th of March, which is four days before this video, this reaction was recorded. So this time, I am going to read the whole article nonstop. And then we are going to read it a second time, where I will break it down paragraph by paragraph, section by section, and we are going to make fun of the absolute garbage that is written in this article. Okay, here we go. One month in, Russia's invasion of Ukraine isn't going how Moscow planned. The war has come with a terrible human cost, killing thousands on both sides, including civilians, while turning millions into refugees, and cities into bombed out shells of their former selves. The biggest uncertainty remains how the war will end and what Russian President Vladimir Putin needs to walk away from a disastrous military confrontation that has strangled his country's economy while dealing with a serious blow to the prestige of Russia's military. Russian forces, while making progress in the South, have not captured Kyiv and have been pushed back as they try to advance on the capital. Four weeks into this war, it's very evident it's not going as Russia intended, planned, or expected, said Stephen Horrell with the Center for European Policy Analysis. But experts are unsure how much longer the conflict will last, even as both sides are facing the tolls of war and the world ratchets up to its sanctioning of Russia. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has been eager to sit down with Putin to find a resolution. He's largely abandoned his hopes of joining NATO, instead eyeing other methods to secure protection of allies from Russia. Putin, on the other hand, has floated using chemical weapons in the fight and is overseeing a propaganda machine that seeks to conceal from the Russian public the devastating consequences of his invasion. Short term is the negotiation scenario where Zelensky and Putin finally sit down after their foreign ministries work things out. They finally sit down and they come to this agreement that, okay, Ukraine will be neutral with all these guarantees, William Taylor, a former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, told The Hill. The long term scenario is one where Putin refuses to acknowledge reality and continues to fight. His people continue to fight. Not well, but they continue on. And Ukrainians continue to fight until they win, until they push the Russians out of Ukraine. That is the long word version where a lot of people die, Ukrainians and Russians. But in the end, the Ukrainians will prevail. NATO on Wednesday estimated that roughly 7,000 to 15,000 Russian soldiers have been killed and that up to 40,000 were dead wounded, taken prisoner, or missing since the country's attack on Ukraine began four weeks ago. The Kremlin on Friday said that it lost 1,400 sol 1 soldiers in the invasion. An update from its last such notification on March 2nd, when it said that almost 500 soldiers were killed. The United Nations estimates that 1,081 Ukrainians have been killed in the conflict, 1,707 injured. You're describing war crimes. You're describing monstrous acts. You're describing acts, events, decisions, actions that will all be remembered historically horrific for generations and generations, Taylor said. We've seen Ukrainians withstand that. But while Taylor is hopeful a settlement could bring a ceasefire in as little as two months, others are projecting a more long-term conflict with a recalcitrant Putin. Because Russia isn't going anywhere, I don't think personally think that Putin is going anywhere either. And so the Ukraine conflict, which unfortunately shows no signs of abetting, could conceivably go on for weeks, if not months more. NATO needs to think beyond that initial time frame about, okay, how are we going to deal with Putin's Russia in the next six months, 12 months, and etc.? said Sarah Bjerg Moller, assistant professor at the 
School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University. In the face of stiff Ukrainian resistance, Russia on Friday appeared to somewhat limit its aims, saying that it would focus on eastern Ukraine and the Donbass region that already had Russian-backed separatist movements. But even that may not do much to unwind the conflict, let alone ease Ukrainian nerves. A month ago, people would have just said surviving and getting to this point four weeks later would have looked like winning. But now, if you end up with a military stalemate and a negotiated settlement that falls short of reclaiming Crimea and the Donbass, that may not look much like winning as it would have four weeks ago. And Russia has continued its threats that it may use chemical weapons in the invasion. While the United States and NATO have said that they would respond accordingly, they have not outlined how. They're obviously trying to get the Ukrainians to surrender. And the other thing is, if they do use one of their weapons and nothing happens, their other goal is to show NATO is a toothless organization, said Angela Stent, who has written numerous books on U.S.-Russia relations. They didn't think there was going to be this kind of NATO unity. The Russians, they miscalculated that too. While the Ukrainians have held strong, so have its allies across Europe and in the United States. In some cases, Ukraine has asked for more from its allies than they have been willing to give, including a commitment to defend a no-fly zone that the U.S. fears would escalate the conflict. But countries across the globe have enacted sanctions on a number of Russian officials and entities, a list that only grew larger Thursday when the U.S. announced sanctions on an additional 400 people, including members of the Russian Duma. And some countries have made big sacrifices, including Germany, which halted certification of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline set to deliver the country Russian natural gas. The problem is Europe particularly, but we, in the end, we're all going to feel the impact of the sanctions. I mean, the Europeans will see this, will see it with much higher gas prices. They're going to see it with much higher food prices, with supply chain problems. We'll see some of that in the US, said Stent. So it's going to be harder to keep this coalition together as this drags on. And people ask, is the economic sacrifice that we're experiencing worth it from what's going on? But in broad strokes, Putin has brought renewed purpose to NATO. Putin talked about reshaping the global security architecture. He may get that, but not in a way that he wanted, Forel said. Taylor credited Zelensky with helping inspire and fortify the Ukrainian resolve. Putin doesn't understand that for Ukrainians, this is existential. This is total war. They're fighting for their lives. They're fighting for the existence of their nation. But getting Putin to walk away from the conflict may be difficult. What it takes for him to realize is that it's going badly for him on the battlefield, for him to realize that his, country, that his economy is being devastated, that the unity of the international community in imposing costs on him for this unprovoked war is more than he can handle. He needs to recognize that these 16,000 Russian soldiers who have died are already going to be buried in Russian cities, towns, and villages. What has to happen is that he has to figure out that he's losing. Oh my God, I feel like I lost 50 IQ points reading this crap. Holy shit, that is, this is more stupid than the last article we read about Ukraine having more tanks than before the conflict began. This is, this is not only wrong, it's, it's outright lying on so many levels. And I think that this is actually criminal, that the lies that are parroted, not even parroted, they're just flat out made up in this article. I have not seen this crap in any other Western media articles. I think that this is criminal, the level of just outright lying that they're saying. Anyways, let's break this down. Again, we're going to read from the start. One month in, Russia's invasion of Ukraine isn't going how Moscow planned. The war has come with a terrible human cost, killing thousands on both sides, including civilians, 
while turning millions into refugees and cities into bombed out shells of their former selves. A few words, a little bit of commentary on my end. So the only city that has been turned into a bombed out shell is Mariupol. And the things that are happening there are absolutely horrific. Now we may see more cities become like Mariupol. Hopefully not, of course, but it might happen as the war drags on. So they're saying cities here. So far, it's only one city. Millions of civilians have been turned into refugees. That is true. Thousands have been killed on both sides. That is also true. That is where the truth ends, pretty much. The truth in this article, that is. The biggest uncertainty remains how the war will end and what Russian President Vladimir Putin needs to walk away from a disastrous military confrontation that has strangled his country's economy while dealing with a serious blow to the prestige of the Russian military. Russia is never going to walk this back. Russia is not going to walk this back until Ukraine, in its current form, ceases to exist. This has been made absolutely perfectly clear many, many times. Russia views the current Ukrainian regime as essentially a Nazi regime. There is no room to walk this back. There is no room to walk back the damage that has already been sustained by the sanctions. It is real damage, without a doubt. There is no way to walk back the casualties that the Russian military has already suffered, which again, they're there. They're nowhere near as extreme as this article describes, but they're there. And the Russian public is not going to allow any Russian government to let all of those lives go to waste. All of the effort, including in terms of casualties, in terms of economic loss, the massive effort that has been undertaken to denazify Ukraine and to obtain Ukraine as a geopolitical ally for Russia or a vassal, if you will, in the future. Russia is not going to walk this back. They go on to say how this disastrous military confrontation has strangled Russia's economy. That is absolute fucking bullshit. Russia's economy has not been strangled by this conflict. If anything, at least in the short term, I think that Actually, no, I'm not going to say that in the short term, uh, Russia's economy has um, become stronger as a result of this conflict. But some of the things that have happened as a result of this campaign, of this military operation, of the total breakdown in relations with the West, have made the Russian economy stronger, have contributed to strengthening the Russian economy, namely the fact that Russia froze a ridiculous amount of Western assets. Uh, Russia has seized a ridiculous amount of uh, Western cargo jets. And all of this has happened, granted, in response for the West having already done the same to Russia, basically. For what it's worth, the ruble is, right now, it's approaching its pre-war level. It's approaching uh, 80 rubles to a US dollar. Prices haven't really risen in Russian stores, not noticeably, not for the majority of products. So the assertion that this is somehow strangling Russia's economy is a downright lie. It is damaging Russia's economy for sure. It is damage that Russia can withstand. And I think that Russia will, in the long term, emerge stronger as a result of this conflict. I mean, economically stronger. Russia will no longer, the Russian central bank will no longer be connected to the central banks of Western governments. Uh, it will no longer be subservient to the IMF and so on. Continuing with the article, Russian forces, while making progress in the South, have not captured Kiev and have been pushed back as they try to advance on the capital. Four weeks into this war, it's very evident it's not going as Russia intended, planned, or expected, said Stephen Horrell with the Center for European Policy Analysis. Western media has this strange fetish 
of focusing on Kiev and pretending that no other fronts in this war exist. We've been over this many times on this channel. There are only actually less than 200,000 uh, Russian soldiers in Ukraine, according to what we heard from U.S. intelligence before this conflict began. Maybe Russia gave uh, some reinforcements to those 180,000 or 190,000 or what have you that we had before the conflict began. So maybe it's a little bit over 200,000, but it's not a huge army group. It's not the 500,000 or 700,000 soldiers that we saw the United States, for example, uh, fight with against Iraq in 2003 and 1991. So Russia simply doesn't physically have the ability to concentrate on all of these fronts at once. And it never expected that it would have that ability. Uh, the forces that are in Kiev have never intended to push into the city. There are maybe, um, I don't have any concrete numbers for this, but it would seem reasonable for there to be maybe at most 30, 40,000 Russian soldiers in Kiev. Uh, it is ridiculous to expect 30 to 40,000 soldiers to take a fortified city with a population of 3 million. So Kiev is partially surrounded. Uh, it might become fully surrounded, uh, probably not anytime soon, but it might be eventually. Uh, right now we're hearing uh, about a drawdown of Russian military operations in the area. It doesn't mean that they're leaving the positions they've already captured. It just means that they're not going to be advancing any further for the foreseeable future. Right now, things are going to go down in the Donbass front. Uh, there is also the Nikolaev front. So three big fronts, including Kiev. Kiev is the least important of all of these, and Russia has never had the objective, at least in the short term, to capture the city of Kiev. Then they go on to say that the war is not going as Russia intended or planned. This has some truth to it. I think that the first few days of this military operation uh, didn't go at all how Russia expected. And uh, we're going to uh, talk about exactly why this is the case in another video. Continuing with the article. But experts are unsure how much longer the conflict will last, even as both sides are facing the tolls of war and the world ratchets up to its sanctioning of Russia. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has been eager to sit down with Putin to find a resolution. He's largely abandoned his hopes of joining NATO, instead eyeing other methods to secure the protection of allies from Russia. The only thing I'm going to comment about this section is how, and Western media always does this, they, they always say, the world, the world is united against Russia. The world ratchets up its sanctioning of Russia. If you look at which countries have sanctioned Russia, it's only those countries, or predominantly at the very least, those countries that has always been fervently anti-Russian for at least a decade now. The only countries that are sanctioning Russia are America's, imperial core, basically, America's imperial core and its imperial subjects. Nations like India, China, which together make up almost half of the global economy and half of the world's population. Pakistan, a huge, huge country, over 200 million people. Pretty much every single country in Asia, including oil-rich countries which are crucial to the global economy, like Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, countries in Africa, which aren't very strong economically, but together make up a huge portion of the world's population, they're not sanctioning Russia. If anything, the actions of most of these countries have supported Russia. In Latin America, in South America, countries, Mexico, Brazil, which is a huge country, Argentina, they haven't gone against Russia. If, if anything, most of these countries have signaled that they're with Russia. They're not against Russia. Anyways, moving on. Putin, on the other hand, has floated using chemical weapons in the fight and is overseeing a propaganda machine that seeks to conceal from the Russian public 
the devastating consequences of his invasion. This section right here is why I said that personally, I think these Western propagandists who write these articles are criminals. They are weaving a false reality, which has absolutely no correlation to real events that are happening, to anything real. But they're also fooling others into this false reality. And because people are fooled by these blatant, just blatant falsehoods, they then change uh, their stance on real events. And as this culminates over a long time, over decades and over centuries, we get shit like what we're seeing in Ukraine now, uh, the Ukrainian war. Basically, these blatant lies are the cause of the escalation that we're seeing in the world. And the people who are making up these lies need to be held responsible. Russia has objectively, Putin has objectively, never, ever, 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 ever in the slightest floated the idea of using chemical weapons. It is a Western lie that they are saying that Russia is about to use chemical weapons. But even then, they're not saying that Putin has openly said that he might use chemical weapons. They're making up this story that uh, the war is going bad for Russia and that Russia might use chemical weapons. But obviously, they're not going to say that in advance, not even according to this Western narrative that we're reading. So this is a flat out lie, even by the standards of Western propaganda. This little paragraph is just a flat out blatant lie, and it needs to be called out as such. Russia has no military reason to use chemical weapons. Russia has enough conventional weapons. The only advantage that chemical weapons can conceivably offer is that they don't destroy buildings, which you could argue that uh, Russia might need to not destroy the infrastructure in Ukraine. But Russia hasn't been destroying the infrastructure in Ukraine uh, unless it absolutely has to, like unless uh, you have Azov battalion guys holed up in a residential building, then there is no other way uh, to get them out of that building other than to damage the building itself when you have uh, people firing heavy machine guns, uh, RPGs from the building, for example. But that is not the standard. That is the exception. Uh, especially in the first few days, we've seen that Russia was incredibly careful not to destroy. And they've publicly said this. They are not destroying any civilian infrastructure, any buildings, unless enemy fighters are basically going to be holed up in there, at which point they basically don't have a choice. Then they go on to say that the Russian propaganda machine seeks to conceal from the Russian public the devastating consequences because only Russia has a propaganda machine. And what we are reading, including this shitty article that we're reading from Western media, is not part of a propaganda machine. This is part of a benevolent information campaign of absolute truth. Anyways, moving on. Short term is the negotiation scenario where Zelensky and Putin finally sit down after their foreign ministries work things out. They finally sit down and they come to this agreement that, okay, Ukraine will be neutral with all these guarantees. The long term scenario is one where Putin to refuses to acknowledge reality, continues to fight. His people continue to fight, not well, but they continue on. And Ukrainians continue to fight until they win, until they push the Russians out of Ukraine. Oh my God, my IQ is dropping as I read this. They're actually saying that Ukraine won't just win. It won't just grind down the Russian military machine to a stalemate, but that they will push Russia out of all of Ukraine. And as we've seen before, this means that they will push Russia out of Crimea, out of the Donbass as well. Oh my God, I have, I have no words. Actually, yes, I do. So my comment on this little section is that it's incredibly stupid. Russia is not refusing to acknowledge reality. The West is refusing to acknowledge reality. The reality is that Russia has and will continue 
likely to suffer military losses in Ukraine, but those military losses are peanuts compared to the military losses that Ukraine is suffering. Uh, they later cite fantastical figures of 7,000, 15,000 Russians killed, 40,000. We're going to get to that later. Anyways, this is absolutely not true that Russia has suffered such high, high military losses. And then they say that Ukrainians will continue to fight until they win. Fight with what? Most trained Ukrainian army soldiers are right now encircled and they're systematically being destroyed. They're facing a shortage of weapons. They're pulling out Soviet era assault rifles. They're pulling out 19th century. I'm not kidding. There are photos of Ukrainian soldiers, presumably training, presumably not using them in actual combat, but nonetheless training with 19th century machine guns, machine guns from the 1880s, the Maxim machine gun. So they say that Russia is losing this war. And even if that was true, that is not the same as Russia being pushed out of Mariupol, which it has secured. If you want to take Mariupol from Russia, the very least that you can expect is another bloody, bloody street-to-street -street city fight uh, like the one that Russia has had with the Azov Battalion and with uh, the Ukrainian forces hold up in Mariupol. So that is not something that can be done easily. Uh, and then they're talking about essentially pushing Russia out of the Donbass, where you have six million uh, very strongly pro-Russian separatists which are fighting for their land. The Donbass is their land. They were born in that land. They grew up in that land. And they have military support from Russia. They have full-scale military support from Russia. So Ukraine will have to... And Ukraine hasn't even been able to defeat them when they didn't have military support, not in anything of remotely the same scale from Russia in 2014, 2015. Every time Ukraine has tried to make some sort of advances in the Donbass in the past. They were actually faced with horrific military losses. And most of the times these campaigns outright failed. Like, for example, the famous, famous cauldron near uh, Ilovaisk, where basically thousands and thousands of Ukrainian soldiers were surrounded. I, I believe it was 2015. It, it's just one example. There are many uh, such historical precedents from 2014, 2015. So Ukraine would have to defeat those republics completely, completely secure the city of Donetsk, which has a population of 1 million people. It's a massive city. It's the, I believe it's the third largest city in former Ukraine. I'm saying former because, well, realistically, Ukraine is never getting these territories back. And then there is Luhansk city, which... I think has a population of something like 500,000. It's the size of Mariupol. And then you have a bunch of other smaller towns and villages. Again, combined population of about 6 million. And they have direct, complete, total military support from Russia. The Russian army is fighting on their side. So they're saying that Ukraine, the Ukrainian military, is going to be able to capture all of that. And then they're talking about Crimea, which Russia formally recognizes as part of its sovereign territory, where 99% of the people are fervently pro-Russian, and where Russia will and has officially stated that it will use nuclear weapons if these territories are threatened. These people think that Ukraine can defeat a nuclear Russia, a Russia that, in this case, which, to be perfectly clear, we will never reach this scenario. I'm talking about hypotheticals here. That if Ukraine invades and starts taking Crimea from Russia, Russia will use nuclear weapons. They're saying that Ukraine will still somehow militarily prevail. That is how idiotic this article is. Moving on with this shit show. That's the long version where a lot of people will die, Ukrainians and Russians, but in the end, the Ukrainians will prevail. NATO on Wednesday estimated that roughly 7,000 to 15,000 Russian soldiers have been killed and up to 40,000 were dead, wounded, taken prisoner, or missing since the country's attack on Ukraine began four weeks ago. 
The Kremlin said that it lost 1,400 soldiers, an update from its last such notification on March 2nd, where it lost almost 500 soldiers. So my reaction to this, Western media is essentially saying, again, we're going off of American figures, figures from US intelligence that were given to us uh, before February 24th, where they said that Russia has almost 200,000 troops at the border with Ukraine. So I'm guessing 180,000, 190,000. This is a, an educated guess. This needs, this needs to be noted. It's not the queer figure. I don't think we've ever received any actual figures from the Russian Ministry of Defense. Western media is saying that 40,000 of these are dead, wounded, taken prisoner, or missing. So almost a quarter of the entire army has almost a quarter of the entire Russian army in Ukraine. I, I have no words. They're saying that almost every fourth Russian soldier that has been to Ukraine is now basically out of action, either killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. The Russian army should have collapsed at this point. We should have at least seen entire Russian battalions, entire Russian divisions be destroyed at this point, brigades at the very least. We haven't seen any of that. We've objectively not even seen a single Russian platoon be completely destroyed. We've seen Ukrainian platoons be destroyed. We've seen tons and tons of horrific losses from Ukraine. We've seen divisions of S-300 launchers of not even just launchers, but the radars and everything that goes uh, with the S-300 being destroyed and shown off by the Russians. Uh, we've seen massive, massive columns of all sorts of Ukrainian platforms be destroyed. We've seen Ukrainian cities be taken, entire oblasts being taken. Uh, Mariupol is one where we've had at the lowest estimate about 10,000 Ukrainian soldiers, but there are estimates as high as 30,000. Ukrainian soldiers. And it's reportedly the creme de la creme of their military, not just 30,000 regular soldiers, but of the more elite diehard soldiers, uh, especially these Nazi battalions, which know perfectly well that they're not going to be uh, treated humanely by the Russians because, well, they're neo-Nazis. Ukraine has objectively undeniably suffered these losses. Ukraine has lost all of Kherson Oblast, and it's a big oblast, it's a big region. Uh, you, Kherson city alone is like 500,000, 600,000 population. We haven't seen anything the same, remotely on the same scale in terms of Russian losses, but here they're saying that 40,000 Russian soldiers are dead, and the United Nations estimates that only about 1,000 Ukrainians have been killed, only about 1,700 have been injured. Presumably, this is talking about both military and civilian losses. At least that's how it sounds when they use the blanket term Ukrainian. So 40,000 Russian soldiers have been killed. 40,000 Russian military personnel have been killed while only about 1,000 Ukrainians have been killed, and that's including both civilian losses, which they're saying that since Russia is turning Ukrainian cities into former shells of themselves, presumably, according to this article's narrative, presumably most Ukrainian losses are civilians, so that puts uh, Ukrainian military losses at like, what, 200? So 200 dead Ukrainians to 40,000 dead Russians. The fantasy that this article is saying, the once analyzed even a little bit, the stupidity of this narrative is just shocking. And here we go on with the war crimes section. You're describing war crimes. You're describing monstrous acts. You're describing acts, events, decisions, actions that will be remembered as historically horrific for generations and generations, Taylor said. We've seen Ukrainians withstand that. What? I, I'm just at a loss for words. What, what the hell is Taylor talking about here? When has Ukraine withstood war crimes, monstrous acts? This has objectively never happened. 
I mean, the last time Ukraine has withstood war crimes is World War II when the Nazis invaded. So maybe they're talking about that, in which case I'm not going to make fun of this. This is something I completely agree with. So maybe they're talking about this, but the way it's worded so ambiguously sounds like they're talking about Russia. Russia has objectively not committed not any war crimes on a massive scale. Uh, I'm not denying the possibility that one crazy Russian soldier or two crazy Russian soldiers may have done something bad, but the Russian military as a whole has never ordered its soldiers to commit war crimes. Uh, on the other hand, we have the Ukrainian military that has put out these videos. And to be fair, it's not the Ukrainian regular military, it's these neo-Nazi battalions, the Azov battalion specifically, where they've captured Russian soldiers and then they shoot them in the legs and wait for them to bleed out and die. Um, that hasn't happened on Russia's side. That has only happened on Ukraine's side. Ukraine has done this. Russia has done nothing of the sort. And then there is the bombing of cities. Uh, the Donbass reports, the Donbass republics, that is the LNR and DNR report that over 15,000 of their civilians have died since 2014 over this eight years of frozen conflict uh, because the Ukrainians keep shelling uh, the cities of these breakaway republics. So again, Russia hasn't done this. Uh, that's something that Ukraine is doing and it's continuing to do this. Like a couple of weeks ago, there was this uh, Tochka U ballistic missile that was fired at Donetsk city, not at any military fortification or any military outpost near the city or even in the city. It was just fired at the center of the city and it had uh, cluster munitions, which killed like 30 people. And this is happening basically every other day in the Donbass. That was just uh, one of the more notable events. Tachka U's, these ballistic missiles are being fired uh, at Donetsk and Luhansk every two or three days, if not more often. Sometimes they're being intercepted. Sometimes they're not intercepted. Sometimes they're intercepted, but uh, they're shrapnel. They're the parts of these missiles still kill people on the ground. Russia isn't firing Iskander missiles at Ukrainian cities unless there is a queer military target and uh, there is basically no other choice. But firing targets at cities, firing missiles at cities just to fire missiles at cities and uh, kill as many civilians as possible, Russia has objectively not done this. But while Taylor is hopeful a settlement would bring a ceasefire in as little as two months, others are projecting a more long-term conflict with a recalcitrant Putin. I agree with this. The conflict is going to be a long-term conflict, and it's a conflict that Russia has the resources to keep fighting for a very long time, contrary to what this article says. Uh, by the way, I haven't talked about Russians, mil Russia's military losses, like the figures that Russia has claimed. Uh, they make sense. Uh, the idea that in the first few days of the operation, 500 soldiers were killed, uh, that makes sense because that was the time when we did see a lot of Russian armor columns being ambushed and destroyed by Ukrainian forces. After that, Russia stopped advancing uh, so hastily. Uh, Russia started to basically fly its drones all over Ukraine, uh, systematically destroying Ukrainian army positions. And over the course of several weeks, it has been destroying ammunition depots, fuel depots, all sorts of supply depots, basically trying to starve the Ukrainian army from everything that it needs to fight. And because of that, because of the fact that uh, the more capable Ukrainian uh, forces were surrounded and some of them were destroyed. Uh, so Ukraine has already lost most of its military capabilities. Uh, Russian losses fell rapidly, at least the number of Russian soldiers that you see uh, dying or being injured every single day. So after one month of military operations, the exact figure provided by the Russian Ministry of Defense 
and this is as of a few days ago, right now it's a bit higher, but as of a few days ago, that figure was 1,351 uh, Russian soldiers killed in action and roughly three times that in wounded. And then you have probably a few hundred captured as well. So that is what I wanted to say about uh, Russia's losses. Continuing with the article, because Russia isn't going anywhere, I don't personally think Putin is going anywhere either. And so the Ukraine conflict, which unfortunately shows no signs of abetting, could conceivably go on for weeks, if not months more. NATO needs to think beyond that initial time frame about, okay, how are we going to deal with Putin's Russia in the next six months, 12 months, etc. cetera? Uh, this is something I agree with. And I think that this article, the way it sounds is that this is a grudging admission. Ukraine is not beating Russia. Well, it's never beating Russia, but the conflict is not going to end anytime soon. It's not going to end in two months or in three months. It's probably not going to end uh, even in four or five months. In six months, it's hard to say. Continuing with the article, in the face of stiff Ukrainian resistance, Russia on Friday appeared to somewhat limit its aims, saying it would focus on eastern Ukraine and the Donbass region that already had Russian-backed separatist movements. But even that may not do much to unwind the conflict, let alone ease Ukrainian nerves. <sighs> Correction. Russia has stated that it would be focusing on eastern Ukraine for now. That does not mean that the rest of Ukraine will not be dealt with at a later point in time. This needs to be, well, it needs to be considered. Uh, if anything, we've seen Russian military operations across all of Ukraine, and I'm talking about cruise missiles destroying, again, fuel depots, ammunition depots. This is happening basically every single day, not just in these regions in eastern Ukraine, in Kherson Oblast, which borders Crimea. It's happening all the way in Ovov, in Ivano-Frankovsk, in Lutsk, in these faraway regions of Ukraine. Russia has the capability to strike at targets across all of Ukraine. It may not have the capability to put entire divisions of forces in these faraway regions, at least not yet. But it is striking. It is working across all of Ukraine. It is fighting across all of Ukraine in some capacity or another already, even as we speak. Now, the military operation to secure one territory or another for the time being, it's going to be focused on the Donbass region, for sure. But that, isn't, that doesn't mean that Russia isn't going to continue on to other regions of Ukraine afterwards. So basically, they're making it seem like Ukraine is this Finland times 100 in the Winter War in 1939, that it's this small but fierce, powerful country with, which can offer stiff, stiff resistance to this Russian military colossus, which is actually just a paper tiger, a colossus on clay legs, and that Ukraine is going to win this conflict sooner or later. That is absolute crap. Uh, about stiff Ukrainian resistance. The Ukrainian regular military, and again, especially including these neo-Nazi battalions, which know that they will receive no mercy from Russia, they will receive no mercy from either the Russian forces or from uh, the forces of the LNR and DNR militias. They are fighting very hard and um, they are offering strong resistance. But in terms of all of Ukraine offering strong resistance, and I've talked about this before and I'm going to say it again, there have up until this point, there have been no guerrilla fighters anywhere in Ukraine, anywhere in uh, Russian-controlled Ukraine, which is like a sixth or a fifth of all Ukrainian territory. And that is saying something. So Ukrainian military soldiers, they are fighting bravely. I'm going to give them credit where credit is due. They are fighting bravely against an overwhelmingly superior force. And there have not been that many Ukrainian POWs. 
a little bit over a thousand if we were to believe the figures of the Russian Ministry of Defense, uh, which pales in comparison to the number of total losses, which is on the order of 30, 40,000. But the idea that all of Ukraine is offering stiff resistance is a bit questionable. Continuing with the article, a month ago, people would have said just surviving and getting to this point four weeks later would have looked like winning. But now if you end up with a military stalemate and a negotiated settlement that falls short of reclaiming Crimea and the Donbass, in other words, short of fighting against a nuclear Russia, which will use nuclear weapons at that point, and short of cleansing this region, the Donbass, of its six million pro-Russian citizens. Okay, to be fair, it's only like four, four and a half million, which is actually, if we only count the territory that is right now being controlled by the LNR and DNR. But anyways, millions and millions of people that are completely 100% for Russia and will fight on their homeland. Uh, absolute clowns. I have no words. They, they're talking about a scenario where Ukraine would have to fight a Russia, which at this point would be using nuclear weapons and has openly said that in the event that Russian territorial integrity is threatened, and this is written in Russia's constitution, if Russian territorial integrity is threatened, Russia reserves the right of first use of nuclear weapons. So these clowns, when talking about a scenario in which Russia would use nuclear weapons, look at what they're saying. Russia has continued its threats that it may use chemical weapons in the invasion. So instead of recognizing the reality that Russia would use nuclear weapons at that point, they're jerking off at this idea of Russia using chemical weapons, which unlike nuclear weapons, offer no significant added military capability, actually no added military capability whatsoever. Chemical weapons are a Western mean. Uh, like, for example, when Western powers declared that Assad is going to use chemical weapons in Syria in Duma, and they parroted this for weeks and weeks on end, and then we saw an alleged chemical weapons attack in Duma after the region had already been secured by Syrian forces. And it was obviously just uh, a false flag uh, to be used um, by the Western powers to give them an excuse to bomb Syria, uh, to send hundreds and hundreds of cruise missiles towards Syria, basically. Um, something like that, for example. That is something that they're foaming at the mouth wanting to happen in Ukraine as well. And actually, I want to talk a little bit more about that false flag, that obvious false flag in Duma. There has been footage, and this is footage that you can find online. Um, it's not like secret footage or anything like that, where they basically filmed how the White Helmets and all of these other organizations were filming this alleged chemical weapons attack. Uh, you had Western journalists um, going to these areas which were allegedly affected by chemical weapons, by sarin gas, which is ridiculously lethal. It's a nerve agent. And they, and I'm not making this shit up, they sniff um, the surroundings and says, yeah, this, this seems like chemical weapons. Like they literally take something, smudge their figures from the gra ground, uh, take a sniff and say, and they just say, yeah, this smells like a chemical weapon. Just utter clownishness. Uh, by the way, I'm pretty sure that sarin gas uh, has no taste or smell. I could be wrong about that, but I believe that is so. We've been hearing a lot about Russia planning to use chemical weapons in Ukraine. And to be perfectly clear, contrary to what this clownish, clownish article says, Russia has never, ever, 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 objectively, it has never said that it would use chemical weapons. Even Western propaganda besides this article, that is, isn't saying that Russia has threatened to use chemical weapons. 
They're saying that Russia has this covert evil, evil plan to use chemical weapons, not that it's openly threatening to use chemical weapons. And if we are going to see chemical weapons being used in Ukraine, it is going to be a false flag, which is going to justify a hardening of Western positions. For the record, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen because what can the West realistically do besides condemn Russia once again? Uh, Russia isn't Syria. If Western powers can bomb Syria over a false flag, over a chemical weapons false flag, they simply don't have the capability to do that against Russia, especially against a nuclear-armed Russia. Anyways, absolute clowns. They're talking about scenarios that would entail the use of nuclear weapons, but they're masturbating over chemical weapons. Clowns. Continuing with the article, while the United States and NATO have said that they would respond accordingly, they have not outlined how. They're obviously trying to get the Ukrainians to surrender. And the other thing is, if they do use one of their weapons and nothing happens, their other goal is to show NATO is a toothless organization. This is something that we heard in 2018 when the Duma alleged chemical weapons attack happened. They also said that Assad was just using chemical weapons to basically provoke, not to provoke the West, but to just show that the West is toothless uh, and betting that the West wouldn't strike Syria, which is just a ridiculous chain of logic. Like, yeah, let's just drop chemical weapons to provoke the West and do what exactly? Um, but this is the official Western party line. They're saying that uh, all of these countries are just using chemical weapons to basically tell NATO, come at me, bro. Like not to achieve any real objective, but to just say, yeah, we did this war crime, come at me, bro. That's the Western party line. And by the way, again, going back to this ridiculous lie about the Duma chemical weapons attack. One of the children who was filmed in that alleged chemical weapons attack was then found by, I believe it was by Russian soldiers. It may have been by Syrian soldiers. I think it was by Russian soldiers. He was interviewed. The kid's father was interviewed. Both of them said that the whole thing was a fake. They actually said that basically the white helmets took this kid by force, told him to pretend that there was a chemical weapons attack and gave him a lollipop and a bag of tea at the end as a way to say thank you for letting us film this. And then the Russians actually took this kid to The Hague to testify that there was no actual chemical weapons attack. And Western media has completely ignored that, obviously. <sighs> Moving on with this shit show of an article. They didn't think that there was going to be this kind of NATO unity, the Russians. They miscalculated that too. While the Ukrainians have held strong and so have its allies across Europe and in the United States. In other words, the Western Empire is the Western Empire. The United States has its client states, all of which bow to the uh, American command. That's, this is nothing that Russia has miscalculated on. This is something that Russia has known for a very long time, if anything. Uh, it is the other side that has miscalculated with the fact that nobody outside uh, this tightly controlled sphere of American client states most of which are in Western Europe. There's also Japan, maybe South Korea. I don't know if I'd actually throw South Korea into that group. Outside of them, basically nobody, well, Australia and New Zealand as well, but outside of that, nobody um, has taken any significant action against Russia. Again, we're talking about basically the entire Asian continent, the entire African continent, the entire South American continent which combined is the majority of the world economy and about 80% of the world's population. And these are the countries that are rising as opposed to the West, which frankly is in decline right now. So the majority of the world is not against Russia. The majority of the world is not with Ukraine on this. Moving on, 
In some cases, Ukraine has asked for more from its allies than they have been willing to give, including a commitment to defend a no-fly zone that the U.S. fears would escalate the conflict. But countries across the globe have enacted sanctions on a number of Russian officials and entities, a list that only grew larger on Thursday when the U.S. announced sanctions on 400 people, including members of the Russian Duma. And some countries have made big sacrifices, including Germany, which halted a certification of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline set to deliver the country Russian natural gas. What a way to pat Germany on the back. What a way to say to Germany, thank you for sacrificing your energy future and your entire economic future to die with us on this anti-Russian shit show of a train. Man, I just love this. They're basically saying that Ukraine has asked uh, the United States to shoot down Russian aircraft, which would entail a nuclear conflict, which obviously the Western powers are not that stupid. They're not that crazy. They're not going to go that far for Ukraine. And that has made it perfectly clear that Western countries aren't going to fight on Ukraine's side. So Western countries, they're essentially powerless to affect this conflict in any meaningful way. Uh, they can supply weapons, they can supply mercenaries, but that's it. That's not going to have an effect of just completely changing the outcome of the war. And everybody knows that it's not going to have this effect. So they know that the Western powers are militarily toothless in this. And because of that, they make it seem like these sanctions, these little lists where, yes, this person is sanctioned, that person is sanctioned. Well, to be fair, the entire Russian economy is being sanctioned. But in any case, they pretend like that is going to change the outcome of, a, of the war. That is just so stupid, so ridiculous. The Russian economy has been preparing for a complete economic breakdown in relations with the West over the last 10 years. It has been preparing since even before the Crimea crisis in 2014. So the idea that this will somehow even make a significant effect on Russia's economy. First of all, the idea that sanctions are going to cripple Russia's economy, it is idiotic. And second of all, the idea that even a crippled Russian economy is somehow going to make Russia stop its military operation in Ukraine is similarly stupid. It is moronic. Moving on. And some countries have made, okay, we read this, they're patting Germany on the back for sacrificing the economic, the energy future of the country to suck up to NATO one more time and suck up to the United States one more time. Moving on, the problem is Europe particularly, but we, in the end, we're all going to feel the impact of the sanctions. I mean, the Europeans will see it with much higher gas prices. They're going to see it with much higher food prices, with supply chain problems. We'll see some of that in the United States. So it's going to be harder to keep this coalition together as this drags on. And people ask, is the economic sacrifice that we're experiencing worth what's going on? But in broad strokes, Putin has brought renewed purpose to NATO. A few comments on this. And first of all, I think this has actually been rooted in the mentality of the political mainstream of the West. And this is the idea that Everywhere people are dying, in other countries, that is, wars are being fought, people are dying. In this case, the Russians are dying by the tens and hundreds of thousands. We we'll probably hear that millions of Russian soldiers have died uh, sometime soon. While the West is basically invincible. The West just gets to pay a little bit of extra money Living standards fall by 1% or 2%. In the United States, they fall by 0.1% and 0.2% because the United States is the best of the West. 
uh, so to speak. And that's how the world is and is always going to be. Uh, let me say this, this is like the effects on the West that this is going to have, this conflict is much higher. First of all, because in terms of economy, Europe is going to become completely economically uncompetitive uh, without Russian LNG. And a bunch of people have done all sorts um, of reports on this. A long story short, there isn't enough uh, gas in the world that can be delivered uh, by ships, not even just by the United States, but by all LNG transit ships in the world uh, that can uh, supply uh, Europe's demand. So the reality is that living standards are going to fall a lot in Europe uh, within the next few years. Uh, we're already hearing European politicians saying that basically if it's 15, 16 degrees outside, there is no reason to turn on the heating at home. Uh, and they're saying this because obviously there is no natural gas uh, to heat up the home, uh, the homes of your average EU citizens, that is. But the other thing that needs to be noted, actually two more things that need to be noted. First is that this policy of sending all of these mercenaries to Ukraine, of supplying thousands and thousands of rocket launchers, millions and millions of rifles, that is going to have a backlash on the West. Uh, because these people, the ones that survived the war on the Ukrainian side, these foreign mercenaries, they're not going to sit idly by after the war ends. Uh, the people who become mercenaries, who voluntarily go to fight in these faraway conflicts, uh, they are usually, well, to put it frankly, they are usually aggressive and dangerous people. Um, not saying all of them are. Uh, I'm not even saying that as a personal attack, but there are people who tend to be on the more violent side, you know, and they're going to have a bunch of weapons. They're going to come out of this conflict and they are going to wreak havoc on the West at that point. They are going to direct their aggressive energy towards the, the West. They're not going to direct it towards Russia because Russia basically will never let them in. Uh, Russian border patrol at that point will be very strong and it will be very strict on who it allows to move into Russia and whom it doesn't allow. So this policy of supplying a European country recklessly with so many weapons, it most likely will have a negative effect that isn't just limited to higher food prices. It will, and I actually hate to say this, but it will most likely uh, result in many large terrorist attacks in Europe five or six years down the line. So there it is. And the third thing that needs to be noted is that the petrodollar, the status of the US dollar and of the euro as the world's reserve currencies are being attacked. If these currencies stop being the world's reserve currencies, the West will basically face hyperinflation. Uh, the US Treasury Department is reporting that uh, the US government basically has a deficit of about three or four trillion dollars annually. That is only sustainable because of the fact that the US dollar is the world's reserve currency. And for the record, three, four trillion dollars is about half of uh, the US government's uh, total annual budget. So their budget deficit is equal to half of their total budget. And from what I understand, things are not much better for the majority of EU countries. So the idea that food prices, like, yeah, food prices are going to rise a little bit. There's going to be some supply chain problems for the short term, but it's okay, we'll deal with that. Uh, just a few more pennies that we have to pay. No, it's ridiculous. In terms of monetary costs, the economic damage, it is already enormous. It has the potential to become a lot more enormous in the near future. 
And then they say that Putin has brought renewed purpose to NATO. NATO has always had this one purpose of containing Russia, that it's obvious that NATO is not just a defensive alliance. Almost every military operation that NATO has participated in since its founding has been to attack other countries. The most notable event is Yugoslavia in 1999. Uh, NATO has actually not defended many NATO countries when they came under attack. Uh, two very significant uh, historical precedents when NATO did not defend their own is Cyprus. Uh, when Cyprus, Greek Cyprus, was attacked by Turkey in the 1970s, and the Falklands when they were attacked by Argentina. And um, the UK has managed to successfully defend the Falklands, but uh, before that happened, before the UK went in there alone, the US and NATO basically told them, guys, you're in this on your own. So NATO's purpose is not of a defensive alliance. Russia doesn't have the physical ability to attack many EU countries, especially in Western Europe. Uh, Russia is not the Soviet Union. Russia does not have these massive, massive uh, tank divisions, these massive tank forces of tens of thousands or, and even hundreds of thousands of tanks that are poised to attack Western Germany. That just isn't the case anymore. So unless you're trying to interfere in uh, Russia's sphere of influence, uh, in, which is the former Soviet Union, Russia simply doesn't have the ability to mount significant offensives on any of these other countries, nor does it have any interest to do so. So the idea that uh, NATO is just a defensive alliance is wrong. Uh, NATO has been an alliance that was just implacably hostile towards Russia, basically since NATO was founded. You could argue that NATO wasn't so hostile towards Russia in the 1990s when they were still expanding towards Russia. They were absorbing uh, first former Warsaw Pact countries, then former Soviet countries. And that really uh, doesn't serve the purpose of collective defense uh, for the Western countries. Uh, the only thing that NATO has done since its foundation is piss off Russia more and more. And the idea that Russia didn't have a purpose until now, well, that was its purpose, to piss off Russia, to continue containing Russia. The current Ukrainian conflict is a direct result of that. The current Ukraine war is the direct result of the West not only trying to turn Russia sorry, not only trying to turn Ukraine into uh, an outpost against Russia, where nuclear weapons, including hypersonic uh, glide vehicles tipped with nuclear warheads, could be mounted in the future, could be hosted, uh, but also supporting a fervently, completely anti-Russian regime in Kiev, which has the sole purpose of just being one big anti-Russia is supporting brazen neo-Nazis. And to be clear, we are talking about people who openly declare themselves to be neo-Nazis. We're talking about groups like the right sector, the Azov Battalion, IDAR, Centuria, C-14, and so on, and has killed ethnic Russians who identify themselves with Russia uh, in what was former Ukrainian territory. So NATO started this conflict is basically what I'm trying to say. Sorry if I've been rambling for too long. NATO has been directly responsible for starting this conflict. The fact that Russia has invaded Ukraine just serves as a justification for everything that NATO has done. But the problem is that NATO did it in the past. And that has directly led to this result. So they're using the effect as the justification for the cause. Moving on, I'm just going to read the remainder of this article and then we're going to wrap it up. Putin talked about reshaping the global security architecture. 
He may get that, but not in a way that he wanted. Taylor credited Zelensky with helping inspire and fortify Ukrainian resolve. Putin doesn't understand that for Ukrainians, this is existential, this is total war. They're fighting for their lives. They're fighting for the existence of their nation. Okay, actually, sorry, I'm not going to read all of this in one go. I want to comment on this. First of all, they're talking about global security architecture. Um, from a Western perspective, the global security architecture is in the shits right now. NATO stays NATO. NATO might even expand to a few small countries. Like it might absorb, I don't know, Luxembourg. Conceivably, it could absorb Finland, which uh, isn't a tiny country, in my opinion. It would be a significant win for NATO. But in any event, they're missing the whole point. The point about NATO and global security architecture isn't that NATO is about to break apart. It's that all of NATO, even while it is still one big alliance, is simply militarily not nearly as powerful as it was 30, 40 years ago. The only heavy hitter in NATO is the United States. All of these other countries are almost insignificant. I don't want to say that they're completely insignificant, especially with countries like France and the UK, which have serious militaries, Turkey as well. But by and by large, these countries, they are a lot weaker, including the United States, by the way, militarily. Uh, they are a lot weaker than they were 30, 40 years ago when compared to countries like India, when compared to countries like China, when compared even to Russia, and Russia may have been stronger when it was the Soviet Union, but modern Russia is much stronger militarily than at any point since after the Soviet Union collapsed. And I would argue that it's even militarily stronger than the last few years of the Soviet Union, basically because the Soviet Union was already collapsing at that point. Anyways, once again, the point I'm trying to make is that Putin and the rest of the Russian government, they knew exactly that this was going to happen. They wanted this. This, this particular part is going to their plan. It's not something that they didn't want, and it's actually not going to the Western plan. Then we have this oh, ridiculous, this cringy, disgusting, more of this fellatio that the West is given Zelensky. Zelensky is such a hero. It's, it's so funny. When Zelensky came to power, there were so many articles criticizing him for his ties with Ukrainian nationalists, with neo-Nazis. And now he's basically Superman. He is basically the number one hero and everybody loves him. And then they talk about how Putin doesn't understand Ukrainians. Ukrainians who have been united with Russia for centuries and centuries, up until the last 30 years. Ukrainians who speak Russian, whose culture is 99% compatible with Russia's. In fact, it's not just compatible. It is Russian culture. Ukrainians who are, it could be argued that Ukrainians are Russians in all but name. That's a topic, a discussion for another day. But the point is, Ukrainians are not strangers to Russians. And the hubris of pretending that the West, this superpower, this empire, which is based on the opposite side of the planet, knows Ukrainians better than Russians do, better than their neighbors do, is dis disgusting. They say how they're fighting for their lives. No, they're not. No, they fucking aren't. They're not fighting for their lives. They're fighting for the neo-Nazi regime in Kiev. They're fighting for a regime that openly supports neo-Nazis and openly supports the anti-Russian policies. And we're not talking about the anti-country of Russia. We're talking about the anti-ethnic Russian population of Ukraine, the anti-Russian policies within Ukraine. They're, they say that they're fighting for the existence of their nation. I think it's questionable to what extent Ukrainians value their nations. Now, of course, many Ukrainians might disagree with me on this. Uh, but I think that many will also agree. Uh, Ukraine hasn't been a nation for the majority of its history. The vast majority of its history 
Ukraine hasn't been a nation. Therefore, there is no reason to fight for the existence of a nation, especially when said nation is such a shit show. But getting Putin to walk away from the conflict may be difficult. What it takes for him to realize is that it's going badly for him on the battlefield, to realize that his economy is being devastated, that the unity of the international community is imposing costs on him for his unprovoked war is more than he can handle. He needs to recognize that 16,000 Russian soldiers who have died are going to be buried in Russian cities and towns and villages. Um, the Russian soldiers that I've seen killed, uh, that is executed by these neo-Nazis, these Azov battalion guys, I don't think they're going to be buried in Russian cities or towns or villages. I hate to say this, they're probably going to be dumped into some grave unceremoniously. They're not even a grave, just a hole in the ground. So this absolute vomit, this absolute shit that this article is parroting is basically, it's just repeating everything that it said previously. The Russian economy is being devastated. Russia is going to collapse. 16,000 Russian soldiers dead. Uh, every fourth Russian soldier that has been in Ukraine has, is either dead or injured or captured. <sighs> clowns, clowns, clowns. And it's so funny the way they, they make up these numbers, 16,000, 40,000. Most of these numbers come from the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense. And the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense declares a lot of fantastical things. Um, a few days ago, for example, they declared that Kherson city, not the oblast, but the capital city of the oblast uh, would be freed within a day. Uh, in the very first days of the conflict, they declared that three Russian IL-76s were shot down over Ukrainian territory. They've been claiming that, Russia, that dozens and dozens of Russian fighter jets and dozens and dozens of Russian ships have been shot down, sunk. Proofs, where are the proofs? Uh, it takes so little to recognize that the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense is not a credible source. The moment they claimed that IL-76s were shot down carrying hundreds of Russian paratroopers, three separate aircraft were shot down well beyond Russian-controlled territory in territory that is dozens, even hundreds of kilometers from the front lines. And they didn't show any images suggesting that any of this has happened. That alone should have been as clear a signal as any that the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense is lying. It is making shit up. It is not exaggerating. It is flat out lying. And these Western sources, Western NGOs, Western media, they don't want to actually look at the evidence that we're seeing uh, come out of this conflict. They don't want to listen to the Russian side. Even when the Russians provide forensic evidence that this happened and that happened and this happened, they want to keep listening to Ukrainian official sources, which are making up these ridiculous lies, these lies that anybody with an iota of critical thinking would just say is absolutely untrue. Anyways, this is it for my long ramble. Once again, I want to emphasize this, that this conflict will not end in a Ukrainian victory. That is absolutely impossible. It will almost certainly end with Russia reaching all of its stated military objectives. And once that happens, I want people to never forget this ridiculous propaganda campaign that the West is putting out right now, that the West said these that Western media, and not just random outlets, but credible Western outlets or allegedly credible ones, have put out this utter garbage, this utter compilation of garbage of articles claiming that Russia is about to use chemical weapons, that tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of Russian soldiers and millions of Russian soldiers are already dead, that Ukraine is fighting to 
the last man to the bitter end, but they're supermen, so they aren't dying at all. Uh, Ukrainians are a hundred times, a thousand times, a million times more effective in combat than the Russians, and that the West knows Russia, or U the West knows Ukraine better than Russia does, and that the Russian economy is collapsing. All of these lies need to be remembered so that we can point this to other people so that we can throw this back in the faces of the people who came up with these ridiculous lies. I do not want the West to rewrite history, to come up with an alternative version to events that have actually happened, to rewrite reality, if you will. And that is exactly why I am making these videos. That is exactly why I am making these rants, shaming the people these so-called journalists who write this absolute, I wouldn't even call it toilet paper, this absolute, absolute garbage. That is it. That is really it for my rant. Thank you for watching all of this. If you've reached this point, thank you so much. Please be sure to like this video if you enjoyed it. And as always, be sure to check out my Rumble channel. Peace.